for patients with refractory disease or, or with disease that is refractory to systemic chemotherapy, obviously, as we mentioned earlier, regorafenib is an option. But there may be other options coming up, uh, particularly uh, the data from the recourse clinical trial is interesting. This is a study that is a randomized phase three clinical trial that randomized patients two to one to receive TAS-102 versus placebo after failing or becoming intolerant or being intolerant to systemic chemotherapy. Um, TAS-102 is a fluoropyrimidine. It's FTD. And, uh, and this agent it basically works different than 5-FU. So it should not be really considered a Me Too drug as 5-FU. The reason we know it's different is that it works in a different mechanism. It is intercalated into the DNA, and it works via that mechanism by, by intercalating into the DNA or being incorporated into the DNA and resulting in a malfunction of the tumor cell because of that rather than working by thymidylate synthase inhibition. So 5-FU is a fluoropyrimidine that works by inhibiting thymidylate synthase. So you don't have production of thymidine. And while there may be some incorporation through the use of 5-FU into the DNA, that is minimal compared to TAS-102. TAS-102 occurs at a much more robust uh, uh, to a much more uh, robust uh, state in, in DNA. The other reason we believe it's different is that if you look at preclinical data, cells that are 5-FU resistant are actually responsive, can be responsive to TAS-102. So if this was exactly the same drug, you would not expect to overcome resistance by uh, treating it with TAS-102. So what is the importance of the recourse clinical trial? The importance of that study is that you have now another agent for patients who failed systemic chemotherapy that improves overall survival. In that particular study, the median overall survival with TAS-102 was in excess of seven months. And the importance of this study is that it shows that this agent not only is superior, statistically superior to placebo and improves the overall survival of patients, but it actually is also tolerable. It does not have skin rash. It does not have hand and foot syndrome. It has minimal diarrhea. And the main side effect is bone marrow suppression. So there is few cases, a small percentage of fibrinol neutropenia, and one has to monitor the, the bone marrow function during treatment with TAS-102 but an improvement of 32%, a hazard ratio of 0.68 in overall survival, is pretty good for a patient population that has failed everything. So where do I see TAS-102? I clearly see it within the indication of the clinical trial. If a patient has failed or was intolerant to 5-FU, oxaliplatin, irinotecan, and if that particular patient is RAS wild type as far as his tumor and has progressed after anti-HFR therapy or intolerant to anti-HFR therapy, that patient is potentially candidate for TAS-102. Now, TAS-102 and rigorafenib are going to be, if TAS-102 is approved, which likely will be, targeting the same population. So as medical oncologists, we're going to have to decide at that point, when do we use TAS-102 and when do we use rigorafenib? And I do not see why a patient who progresses on TAS-102 could not receive regorafenib and vice versa. You know, so I think we're going to be seeing in the fit patient some form of sequencing of those agents. If you are to avoid skin toxicity, I think TAS-102 is probably a better way to go. If you want to avoid bone marrow suppression in somebody who has already significant neutropenia as a result of prior therapies, then potentially starting with ergorafenib may be the way to go. We do not know at this point if one drug is superior to another. And frankly, the hazard ratio, even though it's not had to had studies, but compared to placebo, placebo, compared to placebo, these hazard ratios appear to be very comparable as far as benefit for in overall survival for regorafenib and TAS-102. It's good to have another option.